Good morning, and Good welcome morning. to Moments with Melinda. Hi, Spencer. How are you? Doing okay. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, to my viewers, uh, my guest today is Spencer Lewis. And I think probably most of you out there know who Spencer is, but hopefully at the end of this interview, you'll know more about him. But Spencer is a musician and composer, a stonemason, and an explorer. Um, and one of the highlights in your website, you, you quote that music paints the rural landscape and quiets the mind. And your website is spencerlewismusic.com to all my viewers. So if you want to learn more about Spencer, uh, please visit his website, spencerlewismusic.com. So, hmm. Spencer, let's start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. Where did you grow up? And about the influences of that time that helped to create the human that you are today. Um, that was Manhasset, New York. Uh, where I grew up and, you know, possibly uh, when I was eight, my mom, oh, Kitty's coming in. Uh, my mom uh, had a requirement that I had four years of classical training. Uh, so I picked the violin and that was uh, probably pretty influential because, uh, you know, Violin is a, was was just kind of a, a great instrument to have in the in the late sixties and early seventies when there was a thousand guitar players. So um, that was probably uh, you know one of the main influences. Or you know, I went to the guitar workshop in uh, Roslyn, New York, when I was I don't know fourteen or fifteen. That helped a lot as well. So. I think the island was a good place to grow up and a good place to leave <laughs> as well. You know, it's a good place to uh, rebel against. Well, I was going to say, did you come from a big family? Uh, just a, my brother, Mark, two years older than me. Uh, it was a, you know, Crabapple Road in Manhasset was a, a sweet neighborhood where we played football. Um, it was unique because my house and the house next to me did not have a driveway in between like all the other 40 houses. So we had a longer field. And uh, so, you know, I think it's just a special time. I think, uh, you know, like all of us, uh, we had a chance to uh, to grow up. Did you, were you a hippie? Uh, you know, that was always, I always remember uh, a friend of mine came to visit me in uh, Wilmington, Vermont, when he was going to see Woodstock. And uh, he borrowed my sleeping bag, which, of course, I never got back. Um, and, you know, I guess, uh, you know, I guess I was always, uh, you know, being uh, tied to folk music. I was always just uh, somewhere in between all that. Uh, you know, there was Dylan, there was the band, there was <laughs> Jesse Winchester, but, uh, you know, The Who, probably not, you know, uh, Jethro Tull, probably not, that kind of thing. So um, I think, uh, you know, I think it was just kind of like uh, what they said about Woody Guthrie, where he, he never really joined any group per se, even though he was part of a gazillion groups, but uh, I think he was just too independent to be align himself with any any particular group. So, what year were you born? Nineteen fifty three. Okay, so you're you're actually younger than I am. Um, uh, so you. I mean, so interestingly, um, so that's interesting. So you you weren't a revolutionary. You didn't go to Woodstock, but you certainly were following the music of the revolutionaries, um, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, uh, Jimi Hendrix. I mean, all those, I mean, back then in, in our day, we had musicians who were, who were writing music as part of the revolution. Did you, did, did you, you must've known people who were drafted and that part of, of our, of our life. Right. Uh, you know, I had kind of a, not a high 
uh, draft number, but that was all kind of part of it. Uh, you know, I think it was all kind of distant until it was in our faces. And, you know, somehow, uh, you know, I think it was just, you know, I I'm not sure, you know, how to grasp that experience. I think I, you know, uh, understood Vietnam a lot more with uh, one of my close friends who became my uh, stone stoneworking assistant for years who got hit by uh, with a... Uh, a landmine the first four months he was in Vietnam. And, you know, so we talked a ton about that. Um, and, uh, you know, somehow I, you know, I'm not sure if the word sheltered is the word, but somehow it was, uh, you know, somewhat distant from me. So let's talk about that. Um, you're a, you're a stonemason and you work in stone. So what drew you to working in stone? You know, and uh, when we moved from uh, northern Vermont to, to jump my story, uh, I lived in Waterville for 10, in northern Vermont for 10 years. And then we moved down here to Barnard, uh, central Vermont. And uh, my wife at the time, Rose, was a gardener. And we were making money. We were making $10 an hour in those days. Uh, landscaping, raking leaves. And I wasn't very good at flowers and identifying flowers or anything, but on this one property we worked on, there was stone. And I started moving stone around. And then the owners asked me to build a wall and, you know, did other things. And um, so I had a feeling for stone work. And then my music took off. And I didn't touch stones until about 2002 when my second marriage uh, ended and I had joint custody of my daughter, uh, second daughter at the time, Ariana. And I wanted to be home and not on the road selling recordings. So I started building stone walls around 2002 or three. And um, so I could amend, you know, my music career as well. And uh, here I sit at the cusp of stone work retirement. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you it's know. so interesting because my husband's a filmmaker and he became a stonemason. We built a stone house in our early 20s and he became a stonemason to help pay the bills because being a filmmaker in Vermont, of course, is a difficult thing to do. So I honor I the <laughs> I honor the work that you do. So talk to us a little bit about how stonemasonry helped to define your work as a musician and a composer. You know, I, I think they were always kind of separate. Everybody talks about stonework as being an art, and my art is in my music. And, you know, when I see a stone worker like Dan Snow, who I've been lucky enough to work with, um, uh, you know, Dan's written a couple books and, you know, uh, you'd have to see his work to understand what I mean by art. Um, I'm just more focused on building steps and retaining walls and uh, freestanding walls, mostly, you know, functional. So uh, uh, I think it, you know, sometimes it defines me in the sense when I get done with a job and you know, I tell the client there's a, there's a, an album and a half in this in this project, so uh, obviously it's you know kept me from going crazy uh, playing every uh, Tom, Dick, and Harry uh, club or gig in the world, and you know I'm just not crazy about being on the road, so it certainly has helped. Uh, not building stone walls, I haven't crossed that bridge yet completely, but. You know, so you're heading, you're heading for retirement and in your masonry work, but not so much in your, in but not in your music. Yeah, no, I'm, oh, I'm yeah, going full just, speed ahead again in music, yeah. whatever that actually means. Well, you just, as yeah. well, you should because people you people need to hear your music. So talk to us a little bit about that going full steam on your music. <laughs> full speed ahead is a, you know, it just you know it's. Uh, 
right now I'm working on a couple albums and you know that part of it is uh is secure my instrumental music that paints the rural landscape and quiets the mind is alive and well with subscribers and digital royalties it's um and you know playing weddings uh got three or four coming up in august and september and you know gigs are cyclical you know you all of a sudden i get 10 or 15 of them and then <laughs> and then i don't have any so it's just funny how it works i've got a few collaborators that i was uh you know excited about working with that could change the dynamic so you know gigs are just uh i don't know what the word is it's certainly not an enigma but anybody that's in music will know what i mean <laughs> absolutely so Hey, talk to us a little bit about Ruins and Foundations. It's Your album has been heralded as an achievement in creating folk chamber music. Talk to us about that album. Well, what I love the most about that one is uh, Vermont uh, Violins uh, rented me a gorgeous viola for those three months that I was making that album. Uh, certainly, I wished I would have bought it, but it was a fine instrument, and I'd never played the viola before in my life. So I think the viola and uh, the men uh, kind of defined that album. You know, it was the middle of the pandemic, and I'm always making music anyway. So um, I guess I just, you know, I just, you know, was intrigued by the by the dynamic of uh, realizing that uh, old ruins are also, uh, you know, contains, you know, tons of foundations as well. So it's kind of the uh, juxtaposition or oxymoron or the opposites and likes. Uh, so there was that kind of theme to the album, but it was really more just the title track. It was really just an, is, you know, it was another album. I've got, I don't know, 21 albums on Spotify right now, or maybe 20 instrumental and one lyrical album. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, uh, marvel at the amount of uh, albums I've released. Uh, maybe it's 30 altogether, but I don't know if it's, you know, the the amount is not as important as what each one means. So uh, Ruins and Foundations certainly uh, was dear to my heart because it kept me sane during those <laughs> uh, COVID years of less, you know, visibility with other humans. And um, Well, a man, a man with his music, it must have helped you to get through those times because obviously your music is, is very important to you. And so having that as a comfort. Um, so share with us your rise in the music scene. Uh, when did you feel like you had kind of made it into the music scene here in Vermont? Because Vermont has a very rich and vibrant music scene. Um, how, did yeah. that, how did that evolve for you, Spencer? It started in uh, Southern Vermont and Wilmington. 1972, I guess. And, um, you know, I had left, uh, uh, obviously left Manhasset, moved up to New Hampshire with a girlfriend on the other side of uh, the river from Brattleboro, and then made my way to Wilmington, where, uh, you know, my parents had a second home and knew a bunch of people and got my first gig at the old red mill playing Christofferson songs. Um, it was, you know, Christofferson was one of those artists that you talk about being a hippie. He was, that was probably a perfect example of, of what it would have been like in those days to, uh, you know, was Christofferson a hippie? He was embedded in the country music scene but he was definitely, <laughs> he was a long hair. So I guess there's that uh, connection there, but um, Christofferson was unique because he had all the uh, the qualities of hard edge music, but 
he was also covered by Vicky Carr, uh, you know, other artists, uh, obviously Johnny Cash. And um, so it, there was kind of an immediate, um, you know, acceptance. And uh, then I was also writing my own song. So, you know, in those days you had, uh, let's say, would you call a steady gig at the mill? Three, four nights a week. Uh, what was it? $25 a gig. My, I was living in a cabin, which was $20 a month. So you can do the math, and I was in pretty good shape. Wow. Very cool. cool. Sounds sort of like a little bit of a hippie life up here. Well, of course. And then I moved to Waterville, northern Vermont from there, because Wilmington was, you know, too close to, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, it was, uh, in those days, the gateway to the Green Mountains. But me and my buddy Rob were looking for what we called the real Vermont, and we moved to northern Vermont. We certainly found it. And uh, in fact, here, I... Here. here, here. So you have created almost 30 albums in your decades-long career. Where, uh, Spencer, where do you find your inspiration to be so deeply gifted and prolific Um and your music, as you know, soothes the soul and enlightens the heart. But where do you find your inspiration? Uh, you know, it just, I, I've learned to trust uh, uh, that words come to me at the right time, that riffs come to me at the right time. Um, you know, it's the inspiration is just, you know, it could be a, uh, you know, a, a a news article it could be just just you know it could be something somebody said uh i remember uh you know somebody once was i was talking to somebody and they said yeah it was a gardener's rain we were talking about uh just that term gardener's rain and that ended up being the title for my third album just because all of a sudden i'll hear two words together and he said, wow, that means something. Um, so, uh, you know. Uh, how, so how do the riffs come to you? Do they, I'm not, right now I'm reading Beethoven's biography and it talks about how he puts together his music and his, he's mostly improvisational was his gift. How does that music come to you? Does it come through through nature? Are you sitting there? Do you, you hear it in your mind and then it comes out through your finger? How, how does it work? Because your music is so exceptional. You know, I think, you know, part of it is the discipline. Uh, you know, years ago, I had a, where do I, don't have it anymore. Maybe I do. Yeah, years ago, I had one of these. Uh, and I couldn't live without it because, you know, uh, you know, it's, I don't know if it happens to everybody, but all of a sudden a line will come into my head. Like, uh, you know, there's more days behind me than ahead. That's a line of a song that I'm working on at the moment. And when it comes into your head, you have to have the discipline to write it down. And if you don't, you lose it. And some days, you know, a week will go by and I'll say, God, I wish I could remember that line. And to the life of you, you can remember parts of it. But if you don't get that exact line, and it's the same with music. So I've got, you know, uh, uh, log books here of of riffs that I've used on. Uh, where is it? My here's the other one. This is the Sony D50 that I got. In, I don't know, 2004 or five. I must, I don't know how many. Well, now you can use your phone. Well, I know this is a little better because yeah. it's got stereo right. and uh, it's got 24 bit. So I've actually Much better. Um, taken things from this that have made it onto some of my albums. Outstanding. Uh, but again, it's that discipline and it's like, I, I'm not sure. I think a lot of artists will always, you know, we don't know where it comes from, but we're just thankful to do it. But again, it's what I'm trying to say is that somehow you've, you know, created a life where you uh, 
uh, where stuff like that will come to you because there's a reception, there's a knowledge that that you're going to remember it. And, uh, you know, I guess it's part of the gift. So let's talk about that. I mean, 30 albums is a lot of music. When you're out doing a gig, you, you I mean, how do you remember the, you know, your pieces? They are very, they are very complex. And uh, do they just come to you? You remember all of your, your work. <laughs> That's a good question. You know, I, being a certified old timer, I might be younger than you, but I have crossed the bridge into the seventies land, which, uh, you know, has enabled me to uh, use that. Um, so, uh, I, you know. <laughs> when, you play, when you play, do you play the music the way you wrote it or do you improvise a lot when you're up on stage? You know, I could probably play, you know, three gigs in a row of uh, my own music and uh, not hit the same one. Obviously, you go through, you know, incarnations of repertoire. So you're doing certain ones that you do it over and over. It depends on if you've got a banjo player with you, mandolin, a bass, lead guitar. It's just different instruments that you're going to steer you to uh, different, uh, you know, a different show each night. Um, I've got that problem where, you know, before I was 50 years old, I can remember every song that, that I sang up until 50. And now <laughs> it's a little more, for some reason, they're just not as embedded. So, well, it's an age thing. It's, I mean, we're all going through that. So you attended the Trailside Country School and you learned there that man and nature must never be apart. So, and that's really important, I think, in your work. I think you do pull a lot from the earth. So, um, and you also practice classical violin with a member of the New York Philharmonica. And then you got your first guitar at age 13 and your mom was inspirational for you. Um, so you've, you are a classically trained musician. Um, you've been called a musical laureate. Laureate. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, Spencer? Oh, well, that's Maria. She, uh, <laughs> she's the one that coined that one. She just, uh, there, you know, there's. I get letters all the time from people who uh, just say that once they drive around Vermont, they just put my music on and it just seems to fit. You know, I think, uh, you know, I live on 45 acres and I got a pretty deep relationship with the land here. Um, I feel pretty fortunate that I, after all my years of traveling and uh you know uh you know trailside introduced me to the land that was just a beautiful thing at the time because uh you know i'd been to vermont before and you know i you know was skiing or whatever but i never completely understood until he took us all over the country and uh, we studied natural history and the environment and just went to big bend we went to Bryce Canyon, we went to, you know, places, uh, out of the way places, visited Hopi Indians in Arizona. And um, it just gave, uh, you know, the West was just so dramatic. And, uh, but I knew I could never live there. I used to love going out West, but I could just never settle there. And, and you know, Vermont, what it did to all of us, it yeah. just like, Remember those days you just you would you just cross the border and you knew you were something was different. Absolutely, it didn't matter if it was the New York border, the Massachusetts border, or the New Hampshire border, or the Canadian border, or a Canadian. You just cross that border and all of a sudden you were back home. And uh, you know, for all of us that you know, God, that whole you know the the Renaissance people. Uh, that's what I call us. The late sixties. For you guys, early 70s for me. <laughs> so, um, so Spencer, I want to ask you, my husband and I, we throw the I Ching every day. I've done it for 55 years. And you do too. I mean, you 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 use the I Ching to balance your life. So talk to us a little bit about that and Lao Tzu and and your and your and and talk to us about this a little bit. Well, some of it uh 
some of it is uh, entered into some of my lyrics. Uh, you know, I'd have to read them, but I, um, what is it? Uh, the strong st stand firm as the seasons turn with change all around. That's the uh, a line from uh, every precious day. So some of it is, you know, you know, I've stolen lines, you know, literally word for word from the Cheng. And it just, you know, I guess, you know, it's like that whole, what's that philosophy that, you know, what do they say? You are every part of, you know, when you have a dream, you're, you're each person in it or, uh, you know, which is, you know, it's all abstract, of course, but. You know the the Ching is you know some somehow part of us. I don't do it every day, thank God. Centered, don't you think it centers? It, it kind of centers you and gives and, and gives you an explanation too about where you are. But I just want to let you know that we share in that with you. And I know it's a beautiful thing. I just to see your, your copy that has been you know Wait. used this for uh, that he that he that he that he bound in 1967. But anyway. So what musicians, like, I guess Chris Christopherson had a big impact on you. Who who are your favorite musicians today? Who are you listening to? You know, I kind of measure it, uh, you know, uh, um, I kind of measure who I listen to these days because I'm, you know, working on a couple albums, working on lyrics, working on songs. Um, I don't listen to a ton of music. I just, I, I peripherally listen, of course. Uh, I've been playing the Beth's uh, album a lot when I just want to, you know, I just love their, their, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of the Beth's. No. Who are um, they? I think they're from New Zealand or Australia. I forget. I'll look that up. They're playing higher ground uh, in, in about a week or two, or I wish I could go, but I can't stand up that long. I'm sorry. Um, so, of course, you know, I mean, I listened to Dylan for all those years, and <clears throat> I think that, you know, my repertoire that I, what I call the unheralded singer-songwriters of the 60s and 70s, that, so I think that my repertoire is still a little bit under the radar, David Blue, Mickey Newberry, uh, Eric Anderson, um, John Stewart, uh, obviously not the comedian. So very cool. So that's my repertoire now, and I guess you know. So I don't, I don't listen to a ton today. Although, like I said, the Beths are out there, and uh, you so, know, gosh, yeah. So, um, so I just want to let my view. You were, you were kind enough to provide the music background music for two of our recent films, the Mad River film and the Rokeby uh, Museum film. And we're going to be uh, hopefully incorporating your music and working with you on our film for the 250th anniversary on that we're doing on Ethan Allen. So I wanted to mention that, that that collaboration is really important to us. Um, now, I want to ask you if you could offer, um, I, well, I'd like you to play something and I'm not, I hope it comes through okay, but uh -huh. if, something i have a final question for you that i want to ask you but i thought maybe you could just riff a little bit and play a little bit for my viewers so they could and and again you know for my for my folks uh, visit spencer's uh website at spencerlewismusic.com and check him out on spotify um because a lot of his his uh, his work is on spotify and um mm -hmm. certainly you are part of my playlist spencer so why don't you play a little something for us and then i'm going to end up with a with a couple of couple of comments yeah you you asked that question earlier you know where does it come from you know it, it you know it just comes from just you know just being uh you know in tune and all of a sudden you come up with a guitar part and there's a melody embedded in it and that's where the violin has been so serviceable for me all these years because the violin is able to, you know, play the uh, the melody. So after all these years and 25 albums, it's just kind of a, a formula for me. And then with your, uh, as a singer songwriter, every 
precious day, we can reach for the sky. Every precious day, spread our wings and we fly. Every precious day, we are drawn to the light that shines inside. So there's, you know, oh. the two disciplines I'm working with are songs and Zoom does not do this, does not do credit. So I just, I want to let my viewers out there know, and I hope I can get this up before it, but I'm hoping to see you there. It's my grandson's 20th birthday, but on August 31st, Spencer Lewis is going to be at the Jericho Cafe uh, from 6 to 9 p.m. And I'm hoping that Rick and I can be there uh, after Rowan's birthday party. But um, so to my viewers, if you can get out to the Jericho Cafe, come and listen to Spencer and if you go to his website, you can see other places where he's playing. Uh, I'm sorry, Spencer, but this this does not do credit. I, unfortunately, yeah, yeah, sure. I don't know how it works, um, and I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to figure that out. Um, but I wanted to ask you before we say goodbye. Um, uh, and I and I think this and I think and I think your pers perspective is probably really um, is really important on this. And you have two daughters. Um, and I'm not sure if you have any grandchildren. Do you? No. OK, oh. but but you have but you have two daughters um, and you care about humanity. What are the words of wisdom that you'd like to give our viewers and especially our children who are facing some of these very trying times ahead? Climate change, our democracy um, and the and the, you know, the the many, many issues and concerns, pandemics that our kids are facing today. What words of wisdom would you would you want to share with them? Well, it's kind of. Uh... You know, the mantra of uh, stonework is just each stone comes that you lay comes in response to the stone you laid before it. So, um, you know, you asked me earlier how how those two are connected, um, you know, and so maybe that's what I've kind of learned from stonework is just uh, just being present with with where you are at, in the moment and uh you know, you got your past, you got your future, but just, just, uh, you know, accepting, you know, what you're doing today is, uh, as valid and, uh, you know, part of your work ethic, uh, not getting too far ahead and, uh, just trying to, uh, you know, accept where you are at the moment. I think that's a song. Yeah. Last stone you lay follows the one that followed. I mean, I think there's got to be, I mean, yeah. I, maybe it already is. Yeah, no, I, I did. Uh, there is a, uh, I did a, a, a project years ago called Seeds and Stones. Uh, we did it uh, at the Chandler Music Hall. Um, and I wrote all the music and, uh, you know, the it was mostly uh, kids uh, from eight to 18 but most of them were pretty young so um uh that was i forget in 2007 eight somewhere in there but that but that's great wisdom and i'm sure you know the whole here be now you must have you know and for us now 70 plus year old uh folks i don't know how much how often i just say to myself just be here now man just be here in the moment and um so that's really great wisdom, Spencer, that you've shared with us today and spending time with you, getting to know you. And um, I want to thank you for your time, sir. You're you're a beautiful human being, and I'm glad that you're here in Vermont. And I'm glad that I know you. So thank you for being with me and my viewers today. Thank you very much, Melinda, and look forward to working with you in the future as well. Absolutely. And 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 to my viewers, Thank you for being here today, and um, I will see you soon. Okay, you all take care now. Bye-bye.